Great. Good morning and welcome to the Southwest Drought Briefing. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the NIDIS and Southwest Climate Hub web pages. My name is Emily Elias and I'm the director of the USDA Southwest Climate Hub. This webinar is a collaborative effort. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the collaborators in producing this webinar. They are Adam Lang and Joel Lisenby with the National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. Joel is the Regional Drought Information Coordinator for the Intermountain West with NIDIS. I would also like to thank the Western Regional Climate Center and Desert Research Institute in Reno, Nevada, and the Drought Learning Network, which aspires to link climate service providers. We begin this webinar by acknowledging that the land each of us is joining from today is the ancestral land of indigenous cultures. As we are all in different parts of the country, this will be different for all of us. The land where I'm speaking from is the ancestral lands and territories of the Ute, Apache, the Pueblos, Hopi, Zuni, and the Diné Nation. I believe it's important to provide this acknowledgement because the narratives of perspective without full acknowledgement of the people who lived on this land before us. This is also important because many of us are land managers or work to support land managers, and we strive to manage the land well for future generations and for the good of all. Thanks for your attention and respect in acknowledging this important history. The format for today's webinar will be a presentation on drought conditions and outlook, followed by time for questions led by Joel. Then we'll hear about CCAST, or the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, followed by more time for questions. I would like to invite you to please use the question box to record your questions at any time during this webinar. Our first speaker is Dr. David Semerall, and he will provide our Drought Conditions and Outlook Report. David is an Associate Research Scientist in Climatology at the Desert Research Institute and Western Regional Climate Center in Reno, Nevada. And he is one of the few scientists across our nation producing the drought monitor maps. David? Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Emily, for uh, the introduction. And I'm going to see if you can hand over. OK, there we go. Can everybody, can you see my screen? Yes. OK. All right, well, I'm going to get started here. I have quite a bit of territory to cover in a short period of time. So um, first, I'm going to take a look at the last uh, 30 days of uh, precipitation and uh, look at the temperature. Uh, as you can see on the left, that's our percent of normal precipitation looking at the last 30 days. And you can see a lot of the warmer kind of red and uh, brownish colors on the map. And those represent below normal precipitation. Uh, the cooler colors, uh, you can see we've had some areas of above precipitation over the past month with uh, some of these recent storms we've had in the past week in uh, southeastern uh, or southwestern portions of Arizona, uh, northern Arizona, uh, southeastern New Mexico, south central, central Colorado, etc. Uh, but overall, it's uh, been below normal for the month. Uh, for the last 30 days. Looking at temperature departures, uh, you can see much of the region uh, in these kind of yellow colors, that's near normal uh, temperature departures. Uh, and then these cooler colors, you can see we have some areas where we've had below normal uh, temperatures, uh, just a couple degrees, but we've had some larger anomalies kind of in the four to six degree range. Uh, up in the northeast corner of Arizona, as well as portions of uh, eastern Utah and northern Colorado. 
uh, looking at providing some context, looking at the water year precipitation. So this is starting at uh, on October 1st. And for those of you who don't know, in the Western US, this is how we measure our uh, precipitation, annual precipitation, rather than starting on the calendar year. We start when the cool season begins and most of the precipitation starts falling. So this is looking at a, October 1st uh, to present. On the left-hand side, this is our uh, looking at uh, that period. And is, as you can see, we're well below normal um, across most of the region. We've got a few pockets up in the Sangre de Cristo range in northern New Mexico and extending into south central Colorado, uh, as well as some areas in the San Juan Mountains and mountains of uh, central Colorado as well that have above normal precipitation for the period. But elsewhere, um, especially southern Nevada, uh, much of Arizona, southern New Mexico were well below normal. Uh, this is pretty typical for uh, a La Nina pattern where this part of the country uh, generally receives less precipitation uh, during uh, those types of uh, uh, La Nina events. Uh, looking on the right, this is uh, temperature departures. And you can see uh, for the period a lot of mix of near normal to above normal temperature with some below normal temperatures you can see here in Utah, northwestern Colorado, up in the Four Corners area. Uh, looking at the statewide precipitation and uh, temperature ranks, this is October through December. Uh, you can see it stands out uh, for this period. It was the eighth driest uh, for the October through December period uh, in both Utah and in Arizona. As far as temperature, uh, it was the sixth warmest on record for that period for Arizona, uh, as well as the 10th warmest in New Mexico. And you can see next to it, these are the, this is the ranking and the uh, temperature anomaly. And this is obviously averaged across the state. Just to provide some more context as to how dry it is, um, these are the temperature or uh, precipitation deficits for the last 12 months. And this is just to kind of give you an idea as far as context of how dry it really has been. Uh, you can see the red areas have the largest departures and those are pretty significant. That's a uh, like 12 to 16 inch uh, range. And you can see some in the San Juan Mountains um, as well as some areas along the Mogollon Rim in Arizona and below the rim as well. But uh, these are these are pretty uh, significant departures that we uh, we need to make up. This is the current drought monitor map, which just uh, released on uh, Thursday. Uh, and looking at the Western U.S., you could see a lot of red and brown, uh, except for areas up in the uh, northwestern part of the uh, uh, of the region. In the southwest, we've got about 98% of the region uh, that's currently in drought. The only areas that aren't are in these areas down in the uh, uh, southwestern part of uh, California. Uh, looking at statewide uh, percentages within these categories, so just if you don't know, uh, D1 uh, through D4 are dr drought categories. And uh, the least severe would be D1, D4 would be the most severe. And this is what they equate to in terms of uh, rankings. Uh, if you look at the D4 drought, that's a drought event that occurs once uh, every 50 to 100 years, as opposed to a D1, which occurs uh, once in every five to 10 years. So you can see we got a lot of D4 uh, across the Four Corners states, as well as in southern and eastern Nevada. And uh, areas that are in D4 to D3, got some pretty high percentages, especially within Arizona and Utah. And that corresponds with the uh, record uh, low precipitation that we saw in a number of areas like Tucson experienced, Phoenix, uh, Las Vegas, uh, and so forth. Uh, as far as impacts, we're seeing impacts uh, in the agricultural community to ecosystems, water resources, uh, snow drought, elevated fire danger. 
Uh, some of the agricultural uh, impacts have uh, gone dormant for this time of year because uh, the grasses are dormant, so we're seeing less in those areas at the moment. Uh, this is looking at the latest drought impacts uh, from, this is the Seymour drought impact reporting system from the National Drought Mitigation Center on the left. And this is the Cocoa Raws conditions monitoring. And these are just some examples of uh, some of the reports that we're getting in, like water hauling in uh, Northern Arizona for uh, cattle ranchers on BLM land. This is like for the last five years, they've had to do water hauling because wells are going dry, uh, stress vegetation in area, cactus are getting desiccated and so forth. Uh, also, in the eastern plains of uh, Colorado, we're seeing um, from a longer term of uh, dry soils and uh, erosion, uh, a lot of, during wind events, we're seeing a lot of really poor air quality in those areas, as well as in the eastern portions in New Mexico. Looking at the uh, basin level snowpack conditions, uh, you can see pretty much the whole region is uh, well below normal, especially in the basins in uh, Arizona, uh, Little Colorado, Verde, Salt, Upper Gila, uh, Rio Grande. We've got a couple that are near normal in the Upper Arkansas and the uh, Rio Grande headwaters, which is promising. And with the uh, storm systems coming in, we just had a uh, little one in the region, uh, a couple that moved through last week, and we're expecting another set to come in, a series of them starting today and uh, several stronger storms coming in uh, early next week. And these are individual snowtail monitoring stations uh, throughout those areas. And you can see the, uh, the snow water equivalent percent median for the date are way below normal. These are like below the 25% uh, range. And you can see those other areas in the Sangre de Cristo area and uh, in the San Juan Mountains and part of the San Juan Mountains, that's the uh, uh, upper Rio Grande headwaters. We've got some that are above normal in those areas, but elsewhere below normal. This is looking at the last uh, 72 hours. Uh, this is snowfall that uh, fell during those last storms. Uh, we had up in the San Francisco peaks, they got some decent snow up there in Northern Arizona. Uh, about you know anywhere two to six inches in the San Juans uh, had a little heavier snowfall in that area, as well as in the Sangre de Cristo and uh, southern end of the Front Range in Colorado. Looking at reservoir storage, uh, this is as of January 1st, and these are average over the state. Uh, we have a couple states that are above average. Uh, fortunately, Arizona had some good carryover in the Salt River system, so they are still above normal. And this black line represents uh, the average for this time of year. So we're a little above average there. Uh, Utah is doing uh, well uh, as well. Uh, below normal conditions, reservoir conditions uh, in Colorado, Nevada, and especially in New Mexico. And then here are a couple, I select uh, reservoirs and uh, the percentage uh, full they are. A couple that stand out are Elephant Butte, which has been really low for a number of years on the Rio Grande system, is 7% full. And also uh, some of the latest stream flow uh, forecasts uh, models are predicting inflow into Lake Powell to be about 53% of normal. Uh, so that uh, that's uh, below normal. Look at the uh, current uh, forecast, looking ahead next seven days. Uh, on the left, this is the quantitative precipitation forecast that's uh, put out by NOAA uh, Weather for uh, Prediction Center and uh, CPC. And these are in inches. So you can see we've got, uh, with this number of storms uh, that are coming in, uh, we're gonna have some Pretty good liquid accumulations. Uh, we're looking at uh, you know one to uh, three inches plus in areas uh, along the Mogollon Rim in Arizona, up on the Colorado Plateau, San Juan Mountains, uh, mountains in southwestern Utah. Uh, they're kind of on the uh, border of the Great Basin and uh, uh, transition into the uh, Colorado Plateau 
as well as uh, some of the basin and range in Nevada, uh, as well as we're looking to get some spillover from the Sierras as well into the mountains, uh, uh, the ranges in far western Nevada as well. On the right, this is the last GFS snowfall uh, prediction for the next week. And you can kind of take some of this with a grain of salt. Uh, but uh, you can see some pretty significant uh, accumulations along the Mogollon Rim, um, as well as in the Mogollon Mountains, uh, Sacramento Mountains down in southern New Mexico, uh, Sangre de Cristos, uh, also in the San Juans of uh, southwestern Colorado, uh, as well as up on the Wasatch Front and the Uinta Mountains as well, and uh, also looking down in uh, southern Nevada, uh, kind of the Mount Charleston area, uh, as well as some of the basin and range, uh, Shoshone range and uh, ranges in the western part of the state. So this is uh, promising. We should see those uh, numbers, uh, the SWE numbers, uh, bump up a bit after the next week. Looking at the uh, current forecast, six to 10 days, obviously, as I've discussed, we're going to be getting more storms. So uh, you're going to see below normal temperatures, obviously associated with this uh, systems, uh, systems that are moving in and cloud cover and above normal precipitation. Unfortunately, we're not going to see it in uh, eastern portions of Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, looking at the one month outlooks, uh, we're looking at back to this more typical La Nina pattern where we've got uh, Above normal precipitation, above normal precipitation in the uh, kind of northern tier in the northwestern uh, Pacific Northwest, and this transition area we're looking at equal chance uh, probabilities, um, but below normal precip uh, across much of this uh, southwest region. Uh, looking at the drought look, outlook going into uh, from January 21st through April 30th, uh, again, we're looking at persistence here of drought um, throughout the uh, four corner states uh, as well as uh, California and Nevada. So I don't really see, unless something changes, which is possible, uh, we're looking at uh, kind of persistence of these drought conditions. Um, and that's the last slide here is uh, our current ENSO status. And uh, as I mentioned, we are currently in uh, La Nina. We're having a moderate La Nina uh, that's uh, occurring. And you can see this. These are sea surface temperature anomalies across the Pacific, and they're extending into the West Central Pacific. We're seeing some changes. We're getting some above normal. Uh, sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific that are developing. And this is the latest uh, uh, model predictions. And currently we are right here. And these are all the different uh, dynamical model models and statistical models that uh, predict these sea surface temperature anomalies. And this is the average in the green of the statistical models, the dynamical models, averages in the red. And you can see by the time we get into uh, late springtime, uh, we're going to be transitioning, it's looking like, into uh, neutral conditions again. And that cutoff for La Nina is this minus 0.5 C right here. So you can see we're looking to uh, go back into, uh, into those neutral conditions. And that is all on my end. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. We have time for just one question. Um, Hannah asks, is there any historical data for soil moisture that we can compare the precipitation with this precipitation deficit? Yeah, there are. There is some. Uh, you can look at some of the uh, NLDAS uh, uh, soil moisture uh, percentiles, and that can kind of give you an idea as to um, where we are at a given period um, in terms of uh, where the soil moisture is at. This, uh, the last uh, soil moisture uh, uh, 
data that I've been looking at, you know, this time of year with the cooler temperatures and some precipitation we're seeing, you know, we're getting a little bit of a boost in, in soil moisture this time of year. So hopefully that trend will continue. Great. I know I said we only had one time for one question, but there was another question that came in that I think is important for us to address. Bruce asks, do neutral ENSO conditions indicate normal or average conditions? Well, they they just indicate that there's going to be near normal sea surface temperatures, but that has differing implications for differing uh, differing regions around the West in terms of uh, precipitation patterns. And there's also a differentiation. Uh, there's varying degrees, just as there is with La Nina and El Nino, um, in terms of strong, moderate, and weak. Uh, there are certain patterns that are associated with each, but as we've seen in the past uh, 10 years, even in some La Nina years, when it's been expected to be below normal precip um, in certain regions further to the south, um, we've had near normal and above normal precipitation um, in given years. And we've also had strong El Ninos uh, in the past uh, five, six years, one in particular that it was expected to be very wet in the uh, southwest and it didn't come to fruition. So um, I could follow up more um, on that. If he had some specific geographic e regions he was interested in, I could uh, give him some more detailed information on that. Okay. I'll let you do that. Thank you for your expertise, Dave. I'm going to pass back to Emily to introduce the next presenter. Great. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Dave. Today's second speaker is a member of the USDA Southwest Climate Hub team. Mr. Sky Aney will demonstrate the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategies Toolbox, which provides case studies on how communities and individuals have successfully responded to past drought. And given what we just saw, um, could be pretty important, and also other natural resource concerns. In the case studies presented today were developed by members of the case studies team of the Drought Learning Network. If you're interested in knowing more about the network or joining our annual meeting, we'll share a contact for that at the end of the webinar. Sky? Hi, thank you for that introduction. So yes, the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, because that is a mouthful, we generally just call it CCAST. Um, and CCAST was developed as a collaborative, uh, collaborative project with several partners. It's directed by the US Fish and Wildlife and Bureau of Reclamation, US State Climate Hub also partners, and so does the University of Arizona. It was developed because there was an acknowledgement that there are complex challenges in the natural resources world and they require collaboration and coordination across landscapes and across jurisdictions. And often there are really good projects being implemented in one area that could have transferable elements to another region, but nobody ever hears about it because maybe there wasn't communication between the two agencies involved or the multi communities involved. So CCAST provides a platform for synthesis and decision support tools. It also supports community of practice uh, groups around different, product, uh, different concerns. One of those is drought. It provides a central location to share and learn from these case studies. And it serves as an outlet for conservation professionals to highlight their work. If they've got a project they were particularly proud of, there were some things that worked really well, they can showcase it here at this platform. It also supports mentors and students and uh, helps emerging professionals get some networking and get some hands-on experience in publishing these case studies. Uh, they will intern for a while and then work on researching and writing some of these case studies. The Drought Learning Network partners with CCAST. The Drought Learning Network, as Emily mentioned, is a multi-organizational collaboration to disseminate drought information, best practices, and practitioner experiences. There are six focus groups, and one of them is dedicated specifically to collecting case studies and then publishing them on the CCAST platform. So examples of what does a case study look like? Uh, case studies are produced in two forms. They're produced in a web app and also in a two-page PDF publication that can be shared with people that highlights the, the main points. 
This was one that we did on heritage genetics to increase cattle resilience during drought. Drought conditions, as many of you probably know all too well, can uh, present a lot of challenges for ranchers. There's less forage availability. There's more potential for land degradation. There is the possibility of having to emergency destock and then restock at a loss to the rancher. Um, and it's often desirable to have breeds or combinations of breeds that have good drought resistant characteristics, maybe good heat tolerance, maybe uh, eat less because they're a smaller frame. But then you also have to think about the marketability, right? Can you actually sell those calves for, at a profit? And so this was a rancher in California who had come up with some creative solutions to these problems by using Criollo cattle and crossing them with Black Angus bulls to uh, produce calves that they could then sell on the market. So where can you find these case studies? These case studies are published on the CCAST website, which is in transition to a new permanent resting place. So at the moment, it, it's actually kind of a long URL and your best bet is to just do a Google search of CCAST Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox. But we'll go to the website now and just click around it a little bit. When you first land on the website, you get the introduction page and you get a little introduction to what CCAST is, the communities of practice. And then if you go to this little list icon here, uh, you go to the case studies and you can view these case studies in a couple of different ways. There's a graphic interface case study dashboard or you can just explore using tags. If you explore using tags, it'll take you to a list of all the case studies, which there are over 100 in the database right now. And you can go down here and you can filter by topic. So if we're interested in drought, we go ahead and click drought and we can see at the top there are 21 case studies associated with drought. Now, if we want to get a little bit more specific and say, well, you know, drought in forests is nice, but I'm really interested in grazing, we can also add grazing to the filter tags. And your filter tags are up here. You can clear them at any time. And we can see that there are four that are introducing uh, strategies that people have used to solve problems related to both drought and grazing. One of those is, as I was telling you, that heritage genetics case study. And then you click on it and each case study has a story map form and it's got different tabs here. It's got the key issues and goals. So these were the key issues that were addressed. Here's some photos of the cattle. It's got project highlights that kind of pull out what were the really interesting or novel uh, parts of this project. And then it's got lessons learned where sometimes these are things that worked really well. And sometimes these are things that the contributor found that didn't work so well and they wouldn't recommend doing this if you're trying to do this somewhere else and so they're sharing what they learned from the project and then there's also a resources tab where they show the collaborators if there were websites associated so three of these collaborators um, two of them had websites and one of them does not so if there's a website there's a link there there was also in this case the ranch owner and manager had done a YouTube interview talking about his ranch and about his strategy and so that's here from this uh, resources tab as well. And then there's other publications so if there's other publications that you can look at to get more information. Um, so in a nutshell, that is what CCAST is and you uh, I would encourage you to go there and just browse around and see what's there related to the issues that you're interested in. Um, and there were there are others, some of them were done on community, uh, community groups that were organized around things. So it, there's a wide range of what you could find. Um, and then I just wanted to briefly mention the upcoming events that we have going on. These are not all drought related, or sorry, these are not all drought network uh, events but uh, some of these are the USDA Climate Hub events. And if you want more information about the Drought Learning Network, go ahead and contact Katie Steele. If you want more information about CCAST, there are links on the website and email addresses that you can email. And that's all I have. Great, thanks for that, Sky. Um, I haven't had any questions come in for you yet, but I'll just throw one out there. If somebody wants to participate in an upcoming case study, what should they, what should they do? Uh, they should go ahead and email, and sorry, I didn't put my email address up 
here, but um, if I, I can put my email address in the chat box here, but they should go ahead and email me and we will go ahead and put that uh, information. We will we'll go ahead and refer you to the right person. So maybe if if it's drought related, it'll be one, it'll be me or somebody on the drought learning network that you're working with. If it's related to another issue, it might be somebody else within the CCAS network. But if you go ahead and just let me know you're interested, we'd be happy to work with you on working up a case study. Great. And just to be clear that uh, the CCAS website, that's a public website anybody can go to? That's Absolutely. Yep. Okay. And, and there are contacts also on that website for each of the community of practice uh, people. There are emails there that you can email people as well. Great. Um, Rich just asked, who's the content manager for CCAST? The content manager is actually, uh, so it's directed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Bureau of Reclamation. And so there are two key people that sort of have the ultimate say on what goes on the website and what doesn't. But there is a collaborative group, um, some of them people from the University of Arizona. Um, I am one of the collaborative group as well. And so there's a group that does some internal reviews on these, and then these go out, each of these case studies, after it's been reviewed and vetted by us, it goes out to a mailing list that has roughly 150 people on it, professionals from all different walks of life. And they also get two weeks to review these case studies, bring up any concerns that they might have about them, or any questions or things that they say, you know, there, there's something that needs to be clarified more here. Those revisions are also um, incorporated and then the the information is passed along to the web manager and the web manager actually goes ahead and posts the content so these are all basically these are all peer-reviewed publications by the time that they get to the website okay great thanks for that sky uh, i'm going to pass back to emily to wrap us up Great, thanks so much. Um, I just wanna call everyone's attention to our next Southwest Drought Briefing. That's a month from now, 11 uh, to 11.30. We try to keep these short. So we'll be um, doing another briefing and we'll also be talking about the new drought.gov website on that webinar. And I wanted to thank, thank you all for joining us today. And I especially wanna thank Dave Simmerall and Sky Amy and Joel for managing the questions so well. And all of the links will be provided on drought.gov. Thanks for joining.